G'day guys, and today I want to talk about an idea. Now it's probably one of the most important ideas that I've ever talked about on the channel, and it's probably actually one that you've never heard of, and the reason you've probably never heard of it is because people don't want you to know about it. So when we think about such things as societal progress, you know, how is society going? Are we advancing? Are we regressing? How are things were in the past? How things are now? When these things are discussed, it's often in terms of material things. We look at metrics such as uh, literacy rates, uh, standard of living, income, uh, that sort of thing. But I want to propose this very novel idea to you today. And this is the idea that the progress of society is not merely a material thing dependent on, say, technological advances and innovation. The progress of a society also hinges, crucially, hinges on its ability to reason. Indeed, it is reason itself that gives way to technological innovation, you know, the metrics that we usually use to describe how well a society is progressing. And this just requires a little bit of thought. You can't build and design and operate, say, a microscope for combating disease and improving society without reason. Uh, reason being, of course, the ability to comprehend and think in a rational, orderly manner. If you just act in a incomprehensible random manner you're not going to build a microscope unless you have of course the infinite amount of monkeys in an infinite amount of time but that's a purely theoretical situation it has no bear it bears no relevance in reality we can also think in terms of organization you can't set up a company that will improve the lives of your community providing jobs and income for local families if you are just doing things for no reason there does need to be reason the chain of logic is absolutely essential to the progress of society now let's do what these um, things that look at the progress of society often do is and look back at human history because I think it's very important that we look at history and attempt to learn from the mistakes and also learn from the virtues of the past. Now throughout most of human history, collective social reasoning, and by that I mean, you know, a free and open discourse where everyone can get together to discuss ideas, you know, what's working, what's not, um, what's virtuous and what's not, how should we operate things, how should we run society and that sort of stuff. For the most part, this was completely non-existent throughout history and this was by design because for the most part humanity existed as a two-tiered hierarchy system of those with power and means and those without it and we can think for example of uh, let's say the nobility and the serf underclass of the medieval periods and the aristocracy and the plebeian class of later eras so regardless of the exact form of this hierarchy obviously you've got different things you have the indian caste systems you have the medieval tiered system and you know Obviously, things were slightly different variations of the same form over time in different places, but it was essentially the same thing. This hierarchy precluded social reasoning, either overtly or covertly, because essentially societal reasoning provided uh, post a threat to the established hierarchy, because obviously people can get together and discuss ideas, and obviously one of these ideas might be, hey, this established hierarchy is garbage, and we should get rid of it and replace it with something else. Now, what changed in the 18th century throughout Europe, in particular, was the emergence of public spaces outside the direct control of the state. A public space like a coffee house served as somewhere for individuals to gather and engage in conversation and or reason debate. So this was a very interesting movement culturally because it created a cultural third space, which is to say a buffer between the private space of the home, where you're always able to discuss ideas free from censorship for the most part and that sort of thing, and the space occupied by state control, which is obviously very heavy handed and discussion was extremely limited if allowed at all. Now this public space allowed for increased opportunities for individuals to question the authority of the time, the power of the representative state and its associated culture, as well as recognizing the interests of other common citizens. So you're getting together, you're meeting people, you're discussing ideas, and obviously when you discuss ideas you end up refining them because people bring new perspectives to the table and you're able to sharpen your skills against either oppositions or encounter newfound perspectives that you hadn't thought of before. And this has probably happened in your lifetime quite a bit. You know, you meet different people and even though they have uh, similar ideas to you, you, know, you meet a fellow libertarian, you meet a fellow nationalist, a fellow populist, they've got perspectives on ideas and things that you've never seen before and you're obviously able to benefit yourself by discussing uh, with like-minded people. Now obviously this is a threat, as I mentioned before, to the established orthodoxy, to the hierarchy, to the society, whatever you want to say, because uh, you know, you can get together and discuss the idea that, hey, this establishment uh, orthodoxy is no good and we should get rid of it. Um, so this obviously could not be tolerated and attempts were made by the state to close such places for 
the disaffected, such as the coffee houses of Europe. Now, what we notice around this time in human history is that the expansion of this public space into a public sphere of open debate and reasoning led to the abandonment of many traditions and the reorganizing of the structure of society, bringing about such things as democratic elections, independent courts free from the state, and bills of rights. Although the results and the methods to go about this were not always civil, see the French Revolution of 1789. So we begin to see how the progress of society is dependent on a criticism of its own traditions, which is in itself dependent on access to a public space and a reasonable standard of living, because obviously you're not doing much debating if every day is a desperate struggle for survival and you don't know where your next meal is. Your priorities obviously are on survival. So by now you may find yourself asking, you know, what exactly, what relevance does this have today if we have already created progress from the two-tiered hierarchies of the past? Obviously, with the advancements of capitalism and the free market, we ended up creating a middle class of consumers. And it's not this, you know, massive dichotomy between those who own means and those who do not anymore. We have a, um, a wider bell curve of people with access to means and that sort of thing. Obviously, uh, the business class, the investor class and that sort of thing is a symptom of this. So what relevance does this idea have today? Well, I'd ask you to consider the idea that we can still improve society, can we not? We may never, or we will never achieve a utopia. Utopia is a fantasy. But we can still chip away at problems of established traditions by, day by day, replacing our old problems for slightly better ones. Now, for an example of this, consider the fact that humanity, for the most part, was once dying in ditches from disease due to the practice of medieval witch doctors. But uh, due to a robust discourse in science and medicine, particularly the development of the scientific method, now we are you know, bothering each other, arguing over whether we should uh, take the life-saving vaccines or not. You know, we've gone from dying pathetically in ditches from easily treatable diseases to uh, engaging with the discussion with Pinterest soccer mums over whether they should give their children vaccines. It's pretty good, isn't it? That's a progress. You know, we haven't gone to utopia, but we've replaced our old problems for slightly better ones. But here's the big issue. As I mentioned before, the progress of society is dependent on a criticism of its own traditions and the ability to criticize and in any meaningful manner, in, in an individual manner in your own home is always possible. Even in societies such as 1984, in that dystopian novel, in a very, very private way. But criticism of tradition is dependent if you want to bring about meaningful progress in your society on access to a public space, as well as the reasonable standard of living, which is taken for granted nowadays. The issue is that nowadays, as always throughout history, the public space is continually under attack by the orthodoxy, just as it was back in the 18th century with coffee houses throughout Europe. Now we can look at a couple of examples of this. Take the press, for example. Now newspapers on paper, pun intended, provide an excellent opportunity for individuals to engage with, absorb and debate ideas because, you know, they're mass produced. Anyone can go out and buy them. They're super cheap and you can read them and there's Tons of ideas from tons of different people from all over the world, differing perspectives and that sort of thing, in theory. But if the press is controlled by a handful of corporations and states, like it is, then opportunities for debate diminish, and it is inevitable that those publications, those corporations, will all put out views concordant with being a corporation, being a multinational, being a globalist, being a state entity, and so on. There is this funneling of viewpoints towards a certain thing, when everything is controlled by only a handful of groups. And there's an amazing video you should watch of all these different news organization sites, uh, the news anchors and stuff, and the audio is almost synced up with just how much they're repeating each other. They're saying the same thing word for word, because obviously they're getting uh, marching orders from their parent multinationalist company. So that's a big problem. In theory, you have this really good space for debate and discussion and idea and reason, and hence societal progress. But due to the centralization of ideas, the ideas put out are very centralized. They're almost the same thing. So there isn't that opportunity for variance and competition and obviously uh, debate, because if everyone's agreeing, there's no debate. Now, the next big idea, or the next big example, I should say, is, of course, the Internet. The Internet is the ultimate public space, providing instantaneous connection to anyone in the entire world from the ease of accessibility of your phone, which you likely constantly carry on you, or you have a piece of technology at home, a computer, or some such that can get you access to the internet. What an absolute marvelous piece of technology. The sheer potential for debate and teasing out of reason is incomparable to anything we have seen before in the history of mankind. You know, I can jump 
on my phone right now, I can jump on social media, I can debate people in other countries, I can engage with ideas with people from Sri Lanka and they can bring their whole own cultural and historical perspective to the table and I can, you know, take bits that I like and critique bits that I don't like. This is amazing. This is a, the sheer level of competition and of course competition brings out the best service is astounding. That we, As I've said before, we have never seen anything like this before in human history and of course it's super easy to take for granted, especially if you're like me and you've grown up with the internet being a, a young man and all. You know, think about history what was comparable throughout history to the internet absolutely nothing you know you have things such as the coffee houses speakers corner but really if you wanted to get out and debate people it wasn't possible for the most uh for most of human history but now we're able to do this and the ability is at our fingertips of course it's very distracting there's a lot of other cool stuff and entertaining stuff on the internet but the potential is there and that's what's really important and when people uh, when there is potential uh, people engage with that potential uh, how many is obviously up to the individual so yes, the internet is absolutely amazing for discourse, for criticism, uh, for progress of society, and that is why it is so heavily clamped down upon. We can see big tech platforms from Silicon Valley, they clearly have no more interest in public debate. They prefer to create their sites to G-rated family-friendly content, promoting people like uh, your Will Smiths with your YouTube Rewind, banning people off Facebook and Twitter. You know, Facebook and Twitter, they're not... um. They're not sites for debate anymore. You're not really allowed to do that anymore. YouTube rolls out new TOS. Um, and this is why these uh, these companies may not exist within our own lifetime because they're sterilizing themselves. But that's a, a whole other issue. And of course, uh, governments are always looking for new ways to spy on people online and identify them. The internet is simply too dangerous not to be monitored. So once you get this, once you realize this, once you grip on like a piece of wreckage in a storm to the idea that society is dependent upon a criticism of its own traditions, it becomes crystal clear, oh so clear, that fighting for access to a public space should be paramount in the mind of anyone who wants society to progress, even for people you vehemently disagree with. And I've never really understood this idea that, you know, these people have terrible ideas, they shouldn't be able to speak. It's pretty simple, guys. If they're wrong, prove it. You know, you run around claiming that their beliefs are heinous beyond all reasonable standards, that they're just so shocking, they're intrinsically wrong, terrible, foul, awful, immoral, inhumane. Uh, it should be pretty easy to, to prove that then, and it should be an easy thing to verbally tear them to shreds, but no one seems able or willing to do this. They'd rather just have the state run in, point guns at everyone, and say, look, Playtime's over, you're not allowed to talk to anyone. Look, if someone's wrong, they're fucking wrong, and it should be easy to prove it. If you're so vehemently opposed to their ideas, if they are so wrong, go out and disprove it. Don't come whinging and whining to the government like some uh, chin-lacking soy boy. So yes, this is a really important idea to get through your head. The advancement of society is the result of often heated debate and criticism. For a great example of this, let's look at the abolition of slavery. Now, the abolishment of the practice of slavery was decided worldwide, aside from, of course, America with the Civil War, through critical debate and the stroke of a pen. Thousands of years of misery, immorality, inhumanity ended through the willingness of individuals to stand up, speak up, think rationally, and make a case. Like, let's engage with this idea here. Every human culture throughout history practice slavery and this age-old tradition was ended through criticism through access to a public space and through reason and debate and evidence that is the power of criticism that is the power of open discourse in closing progress is a measurement of our tolerance for discourse in the absence of reasonable discourse which so many many political cultural you name it, movements of the contemporary day want to abolish, well, if we can't talk to one another to get what we want, the only way to get what we want is by the sword. Thanks all for sticking around, and have a good one.